Hello, and welcome to the debrief from the business of fashion, where each week we go deep on our most popular BOF professional stories with the correspondents who created them. I'm Lauren Sherman. Giorgio Armani is one of the most successful, if not the most successful, fashion designers in the world. He's also hugely influential. After launching his brand in 1975, well into his 40s, he changed the way men and women dressed, introducing a softer suiting silhouette and other sneakily rebellious designs that have left their mark on fashion forever. Now 88 years old, he's still designing, and his work is finding a new following with younger fashion obsessives. Recently, BOF's editor-at-large, Tim Blanks, wrote a surprising, intimate profile of Armani for a series spotlighting members of the BOF 500, our annual list of the people shaping the global fashion industry. Tim has been writing about Mr. Armani for decades, and today we have the privilege to talk to him about how the piece came together. Tim, thank you so much for joining me on The Debrief. Lauren, I'm very happy to be here. It's exciting to be on the debrief. The first thing I wanted to talk to you about regarding this story is how it came together. You have been covering Giorgio Armani for, what, 30 or 40 years? Uh, Not quite. (laughs) I have interviewed him a number of times over at least the last 20. And uh, I traveled with him, actually, and had some, I guess, pretty great adventures with him. And we had been planning a, a major profile on him before the pandemic struck because uh, there were a number of business milestones and we thought it would be a great opportunity to tie a new profile in with what was happening. But then obviously he was literally the first designer to cancel a show because of COVID. And uh, so everything went on hold for these years that we've been dealing with isolation. And then we kind of reactivated the idea and we're all just waiting for it really to fall into place. And it, and it did in Milan a few weeks ago. And how do you get a designer like that to say yes to doing a big piece in depth? Obviously, you've known him for a long time, but what else does it take? We were lucky in that years ago, I did a really, really big newspaper piece on him for The Independent in London. And I went to Tokyo when he opened his flagship store in Tokyo and really followed him around with his architects and so on. And it was, it was very, very interesting. And then we had this very strange connection, remembering that Giorgio Armani does not speak English and I do not speak Italian and I wouldn't inflict my French on him. So we were always working with translators, but he has always had extremely good translators, like UN level. But after that trip, to we were in Tokyo and, and somebody came up to me and said, uh, how do you feel about going to Sydney with Mr. Armani? Because he's going to see what his support for Kate Blanchett and her theater company is, how that's working out. So I said, well, of course, I'd love to. So we flew down to Sydney and extended this holiday to Tokyo. And, and um, no holiday, it wasn't a holiday. It was a, an assignment, I should say. And I had a great time in Sydney and watching him work on a whole other level. I mean, we visited Kate's Theatre. He was also supporting Russell Crowe's football team at that time. So we went out to see them practice on a beach near Bondi. And so I saw a whole other side of him. And that was uh, another really interesting moment. There was a a dinner or a lunch or something at a restaurant called the Icebergs on Bondi Beach. And he and I stood outside for about 40 minutes talking. And I don't know how we were talking. But when I came back inside, I thought, wow, that was so interesting. He told me all these great things. And then I was thinking, how did he tell me these great things? We just had this really weird osmosis. And I wrote the story and... I did hear afterwards that he felt it was one of the best things anybody had ever written about him. So we had in the pipeline that he would like to do another piece like that one day. And that was always there. That happened to be how this opportunity came about. And you mentioned that there had been quite a few business milestones happening with that business over the last few years. It's obviously been in the news recently about what's going to happen to it in the next 20 years. It's one of the few independent fashion brands that still exist. Is it going to sell, et cetera, et cetera. But what was driving your interest at this moment in the brand? Well, my interest was much more personal. 
I have to say that that I was much more interested in getting him to talk about some things that he's never talked about in his private life. Just curious to see how he felt I, turning 88. Also, he's been ill a few times, seriously ill a few times lately, and, and recovered and still runs that company. And he's fiercely independent. I think he values his independence more than anything. So speculation about the future of the company, obviously for him, preserving its independence when he is no longer around is a critical thing. And I think that that's really as much as he'll talk about. And then all the other stuff, the speculation is, is this kind of inevitable kind of flim flam that drifts around a company that, that is that huge. We call this story the lion in winter because that's how I think of him. I think of him as an emperor at the end of his reign and what you do about succession, which is a huge issue with a lot of people in fashion. You can look around at a lot of businesses and wonder what happens when the sort of figurehead passes on. But what was extraordinary is I went to watch him working backstage and his control is total. At the Emporio Armani show, he decided that the light wasn't catching the model's cheeks. They were in the lineup to go out for the show to start. He worked his way down every single model, personally adjusting their eye makeup, every single one, and he did it himself. He did tell me that his joy is the show, that intimate engagement with each of these women who is embodying what he is created you know his favorite thing is when he sees an idea he's had fully realized just the way he imagined it which i find you know 88 years old to be still so caught up in that aspect of design quite inspiring and charming in a way i mean i have been backstage and watched him be an ogre i've watched him yell i've watched him make people cry Another reason why I wanted to talk to him more personally rather than professionally, because I wanted the other Armani, the Armani that people don't really know that well. I wanted to be able to show that if I could. And I, mean, I hope that's what we managed to do. The vulnerability that he displayed with you was really interesting. I thought the first thing he said that I was like, oh, that's fascinating, was that he wishes he had learned English talking about the translation thing. And then the second point about the young child who is around the office now, can you talk a bit about what he said there? Well, the accent thing was fascinating because he called my accent Australian British and I, I'm from New Zealand and he's only off by a few thousand miles there. But he really liked listening to me talk, which is, I don't get that too often. The fascinating thing about the little girl where just having her around and he said he's suddenly he's exploring his tender side that he's maybe never allowed himself to to feel that love that incredibly open selfless love what was fascinating to me is i had almost that same conversation with karl lagerfeld where he in his 80s had his cat pet and that little boy hudson kronig who was the son of Brad Kronick, who was one of Lagerfeld's models and also became part of his coterie of close friends and associates. And Lagerfeld said the same thing, that, that I never thought I could feel this way about a cat and a, and a little kid, like this sort of grandfatherly love. And Armani said more or less the same thing, that he felt this sort of selflessness. We had talked in the past about why he never had children and whether he felt he'd missed out on, on that. And he'd never really gone there with that before. It didn't make him wish he'd had kids because he said he would have been probably quite a difficult father. But it did make him aware of what he might have missed out. He was very conscious of what he might have missed in his life by not having kids. Um, it was extremely poignant, I thought, when he talked about that. I've never interviewed him. I've only done one Q&A via email. But I did find, and I, maybe it's the translator being involved, that it was a very frank response. It was like the best. I mean, we never do those. And we had. I think it was because you couldn't do the interview or something. And we did a Q&A with him via email. And it was one of the most frank, like, straightforward 
email and it it actually made sense the responses it didn't sound like a pr rewrote them but it was extraordinary to me how frank and open he was with you and how you were able to weave that into a piece that was still about the person who built this business and you really because a human being and an entrepreneur they're not two separate people it's one person and the way you were able to you know weave in his personal life into how he built this business i thought it was extraordinary and and really touching and also just a great piece of journalism he very famously started his business a little bit later in life than typical he was what 40 or something when he launched do you think that is part of the reason that he's still so energetic and i was looking at one of the photos from this last show and you know whatever has happened to him he doesn't particularly look frail curious if you think that him starting it a bit later has made him feel the urge to keep going and not to retire the way valentino did I think it's critically important that he started his business late because he, I think, is innately quite a cautious person. And if he hadn't had his partner, Sergio Galeotti, he would probably never have done what he did. He had this business partner and life partner who really whipped him along. It's a classic fashion story. It, it's kind of interesting. Valentino had Giancarlo Giamatti, who was also an architecture student like Sergio Galeotti was. And Yves Saint Laurent had Pierre Berger. And you can look at these very, very close, these romantic liaisons that get extended into these business empires. I think that it was really meeting Galeotti that put him in, in the situation where, oh, I can do this on my own because he was working for Nino Cerruti and he was doing extremely well, but I'm not sure whether he would have gone independent or would have gone out on his own if he didn't have this partner kind of pushing him, maybe making him sell his Volkswagen to finance the, their, their own business, that sort of thing. One of my obsessions is I love the movie Citizen Kane and I love the idea that everything can come back to his sled when he was a child, your rosebud. That sled is the key that unlocks Kane's whole incredible success story. So I have talked to Armani in the past about this idea because he's a huge movie buff from the 30s and 40s. I think Hollywood movies in the 30s and 40s really really shaped his sensibility. And so he used to go and hide in the local movie theater when, when the Allied bombers were flattening his hometown. And so he had this very, very umbilical connection with as a sort of safety or something in, in movie fantasy. But it's not quite the same as Rosebud, but he would say that Galeotti's death would be the Rosebud because even though they were extremely successful when Galeotti died in 1985, they were already very successful at that point. But he didn't think he could go on on his own and then he decided for sergio he had to that's armani mark one armani mark two you know that that challenge is really what drove him to become well what he is the most successful designer in the world it really is remarkable looking forward I feel like his designs have a renewed relevance in culture right now. There's one element I was talking to a friend whose mother wore it almost exclusively in the 80s and 90s and said it's a lot of workwear. That part of it doesn't make sense, but I see it in vintage stores quite a bit now. People picking it up, collecting it, and definitely the vintage, the stuff from the 80s, the 90s. But what relevance do you think it has in culture right now and how do you see it evolving going forward not only during his tenure but whatever happens to it afterwards for the longest time it used to bug me when i'd be standing outside his shows waiting to interview people coming out of you know what did you think that thing the videos i used to do for years and years and there was this held view that armani was you go to Armani shows because he advertised in the magazine or whatever. And people sold him so short. He was a revolutionary. In his moment, I can think of maybe five people in, in fashion who had the impact that he had. And the problem with revolutionaries is that their, their edges get rubbed off and people start taking them for granted and their revolution is either co-opted or passes on down the road. Other people come along and do it, take it over and it... And then the original achievement is kind of fades a little bit. 
never forgetting that he was a revolutionary. And even if his revolution was as a reaction to what he saw around him, so in a way he was a reactionary rather than a revolutionary, but the revolution was created by his reaction. Something that's never been fully understood about Armani is his respect and appreciation of eccentricity. And I, I, I doubt that many people would look at Giorgio Armani and say he's an eccentric designer in the way that Vivian Westwood is or Charles James was or Elsa Scaparelli or all the people that he actually reveres. I asked him once if he could be anybody else, who, who would he like to be? And he said Jean Cocteau. People just don't think of Armani in those terms. But what has happened? He described his own eccentricity, he said, was his radicalism in the way he approached design, the way he completely de-stuffed design. So he said that radicalism was his kind of tip of the cap to eccentricity. But as he has got older and, and the Armani offering is fractured into all these different byways where he can do a very commercial collection, he can do a very sportswear collection, so on. And then, then he has the main ready to wear line and then he has Armani Privé, his couture. He's been able to explore a more familiar in a way eccentricity it, where things look a little more eccentric than they did in the past and um, i think that that last ready to wear collection which was kind of like scheherazade or something it was it was like a a story from the arabian nights i mean not literally but there was that element in it and you see the softness the lightness now and the richness which are very different qualities from what you'd associate with the Armani revolution originally. That especially that the collection was about gold thread, field door, my French, French pronunciation is pretty awful, but golden thread. And there was this, the notion that this golden thread linked everything in the collection. So there was this blue that was the color of the desert sky at midnight with this golden thread, kind of like stars. And, and then there was ocean blue with the thread kind of like sparkle, sparkling, you'd say sunlight or whatever, the sparkle and the, the lightness and the richness of the clothes feels very much like the confident expression of a man who doesn't really pay much heed to what is happening in the world of fashion. He says that he looks at everything, but you know, he's, his reputation is a very, very fierce critic of his peers. And, and I think that that's people are responding to that, that there's something so unique about Armani now that you see it as him. You see the statement being a lot more personal perhaps. And I think that strikes a chord with people. To me, it's a depth and complexity and a bit more intellectual and there aren't that many intellectual designers. Do you think that that's part of it, that fashion is so slick and straightforward and surface now and that he is seen almost as an eccentric because of the fact that he is so nuanced in everything he does? Well, that's an interesting idea because it is nuanced. And there also is the incredible gratification that wearing his clothes can give you. They have a sort of timelessness. I'm not sure if you think of fashion as being quite, you're suggesting that it is quite slick and mechanical now. I think it depends, but at that level, even the designers that have big ideas, the big ideas are in his clothes. The designers now who are younger, who have big ideas, it's less in the clothes. It's more about the way the clothes are presented. Whereas I think when I look at his clothes or Condé Garçon, the ideas are in the clothes, not necessarily the presentation of the clothes. And that's just how I see it. I'm curious, someone who has far more information and knowledge than me, how you see it. I think you're right about the clothes as an expression of an individual aesthetic, being very true to the spirit of the creator. But I don't know, I, um, it, it, it's, it's quite a long shot, I guess, but I would look at somebody like Jonathan Anderson or Issey Miyake, admittedly Issey Miyake was in his 80s, but clothes that you don't necessarily attach to the Armani aesthetic, but you have the sense of the creator's intellect and ethos and passion and even their hobbies in the clothing. And I think 
That is one thing you can do with Armani now, even though he doesn't, like I said before, he doesn't ride a wave of trends at all, but you can link him now to things that are happening at the other end of the fashion spectrum. You can see a continuity now. I think people are more open to seeing a continuity where they were always a bit dismissive in the past. Not always, but they became as time wore on. And now I can't think of another designer of his vintage who is still relevant in the way he is. I mean, Valentino has retired. Ralph Lauren, I suppose. Ralph Lauren, but Ralph Lauren does something totally different and it still does it very well, I think. But it's not about the construction of the garment. It's about the world he creates. He's the best at creating a world. You go into Ralph Lauren's store and I'd, I would argue that's a more interesting experience than going into an Armani store. But if you look at a gown that Armani designed versus a gown that Ralph Lauren designed, I think one person is more thought-provoking than the other in that sense. So I do think Ralph Lauren is still doing interesting things, but it's not the same business. And yet one thing that's interesting when you walk into an Armani store is how surprising it can be, how there is an element of the unexpected, which I think people are discovering. Maybe it was always there, but it just wasn't acknowledged as much. There's something fascinating to be said for somebody who can survive in an industry like fashion for as long as Armani has to be dominant in an industry like fashion. And the word relevance is is on everybody's minds. I think the whole industry is worried about relevance. Is that is the entire fashion industry relevant? You know, with the way the world is, the way the world is going. And you look to your sages in a way. If you look at the history of human civilization, you have these sages, these wise old men. And if a wise old man is still capable of making clothes as beautiful as the clothes he's been showing, then he has this added value. <laughs> Tim, thank you so much for joining me. This was such a pleasure. I always learned so much speaking to you. Thank you, Lauren. And um, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk about Giorgio Armani because he's somebody who is a huge part of history and will be a huge part of history going forward. And it's wonderful to be able to acknowledge that now and not have to do a sort of obit or something to say right now, this is what he's doing and appreciate this man who is still a wonderful creator and and still has an awful lot to teach us all. You can read Tim's story and many others, especially his coverage from Fashion Week. Be sure to check out at businessoffashion.com. And we have also included links in the show notes. You have been listening to The Debrief, produced and edited by Kate Barton, Emma Clark, Eric Bria, and Georgie Rutherford in the BOF studio. I'm Lauren Sherman, and I will be back next Wednesday with a new episode. Thanks so much for joining us, and be sure to follow us and like us and do all of that stuff wherever you get your podcasts. You can join BOF Professional today with an exclusive 25% discount on an annual membership covering key industry topics from sustainability to technology to marketing with access to our case studies, live events, and iOS app. To get this special offer and benefit from 25% off of a membership, head to the link in the episode show notes or enter the coupon code DEBRIEF at checkout. Visit businessoffashion.com slash memberships. Thank you.